Well, thank you for the um, kind invite to uh, ask me to come and talk about one of the clocks in the collection here. I had the privilege of um, men's clocks um, here in, in this building, and uh, it, it's really a, a privilege uh, to, to be able to look at and, and handle and conserve these very important objects. And if I just introduce myself, um, I'm Malcolm Archer, I, um, I'm a clockmaker. Uh, the general phrase used these days is a horological conservator, uh, which is what I do. I conserve objects of horological interest, not only clocks. I'm based in West Eden, down in West Sussex, um, where I'm a part-time tutor at West Eden College. Um, and I have my own conservation studio there as well. Um, we have uh, students for one to two years, sometimes three years at college, where we train uh, future horologists in bench skills, basic skills, in uh, you know, hand skills that are required to be clockmakers and to further conserve uh, clocks both in domestic settings, museum settings and, and other, other places as well. Um, if you can indulge me just to before I move on and talk about the, the, uh, the clock. Um, uh, conservation, when we're dealing with clocks, conservation is a problem area. Uh, we have objects which largely are running. They're continually running. And that, in very essence, is a problem to a uh, conservator, because it's naturally wearing. So my job as a conservator is to minimise the risk, minimise the wear, so that the objects continue to run, generally, although there are some clocks which are stopped for their own well-being. Um, but that's the main role of ecology, is this balance between keeping the clock running safely, efficiently, and maintaining it safely for future generations. Right, here is the regulator by Justin Vullamy and Benjamin Gray. Uh, most people would have walked past this regular uh, occurrences. Um, you may well know this clock, you may well know a lot about it. So if you do, please forgive me for covering uh, ground that you already know about. Uh, it's, as we see it here, it's uh, a weight driven, long case regulator. You can see clearly the second pendulum. Uh, and it's weight driven, you can see the weight hanging there through the glass door. First question is really, why a regulator? What's the purpose of this clock? And the obvious answer is, it, it is to measure time accurate, accurately. That's the whole purpose of this clock. To time. When this clock was made, there was a problem with many clocks not keeping time. Problems of oil, uh, deteriorating and problems of temperature and atmosphere changing the length of the pendulum. Uh, we'll speak more of that in a little while. But to give some background to this talk, I have a slide here which shows uh, an image of the transit of Venus. Um, this is particularly relevant to this period of time when this clock was made. Uh, two occurrences uh, in 1761 and 1769. Uh, you probably already, already know that the importance of measuring the time it takes for Venus to cross the Sun would enable mathematicians to calculate distances, astronomical distances, more accurately than previously had been done. But they needed a way of doing it. They needed to know exactly how much time so they needed accurate clocks. And this drove, really, um, clockmakers to really put a lot of time into creating timepieces that would be consistent. Um, before we go on again to look at this clock, we need to just consider this well-known man, John Harrison. Um, 
you may know that uh, he was very involved in trying to find the answer to the longitude problem and he created a whole series of clocks to try and create an accurate timepiece that would be reliable and that would be precise so you could take measurements using this object. Here is um, a clock by Harrison and you'll notice it's made of wood. There are similarities with this clock, which is why I'm showing it, to the clock in the hallway. He devised a mechanism for controlling the length of a pendulum called the gridiron. He discovered that if you connected brass and steel rods together, shown here, that the expansion of each metal is different and if they're connected one by one, top to bottom, as the temperature changes, the length of the pendulum remains the same. Thus you could get accurate timekeeping. So that was a big advance, and he trialled these clocks, and they were extremely accurate, and continue today, some of them still running, to be extremely accurate. Another device which he invented was the grasshopper escape. It's a strange name. You may be familiar with the phrase. You may have even seen one of these peculiar escapements in operation. Uh, we'll have some images in a moment. It was to reduce the problem of oil. The main problem with a uh, clock escapement, it requires oil. As soon as that oil deteriorates, it immediately affects the reliability and timekeeping of the clock. So he devised an escapement without oil, that did not need oil. And Justin Villamy and Benjamin Gray used the same escapement in the clock outside. So, looking at the, the dial of the clock, it's immediately um, recognisable as a regulator dial. It, it's designed like this because the purpose of this clock is not really to, to tell time as you pass by. It's a time measuring machine. So we have a very large seconds dial here. A minute hand, long and slender, simply and very easy to read and use. And down here, right at the bottom, is a hour indicator, which actually takes a little bit of uh, getting used to when you're reading it. Another problem with the weight-driven clock um, is it needs winding up. Once a week, someone has to put a key in, turn it, and as soon as you're winding the, key, winding the weight up, the power is no longer driving the clock, and the clock goes backwards or stands still. That's a serious problem if you are trying to use it for making a sort of um, documented uh, measurement. So this clock and many other regulators have maintaining power, a device which again we'll look at in a moment when we're inside the movement. Here's the winding hole, but you can't put a key in it at the moment, it's blocked. And if you look when you're out there you'll see it's blocked. You have to pull a lever. Pulling that lever opens the hatch and puts power on one of the wheels of the clock so that whilst the clock is being wound there's a spring keeping the clock moving. Again, critical. Interestingly this form of maintaining power is different and uh, in a way a more crude method than the one used by an inventor. John Harrison, which required nothing but just winding the clock and it was automated. Here we have the uh, uh, clearer picture of the pendulum, uh, the pendulum bob and the weight. The weight uh, driving this clock is quite light, it's about eight pounds, it's not particularly heavy, it doesn't require huge amount of weight. The bob, the pendulum bob, however, 
is quite another thing. That is full of lead. It's a brass case, it's full of lead. It weighs about 35 pounds, 15 kilograms. It's, it is substantial. And below, below there we have what's known as a beat indicator. So that you can see how far the pendulum is reaching. Again, it's very important to know that we're using the clock for scientific measurements of time. Finally, we are actually going to have a look inside the movement. You've removed the hood. You're ready to look inside the movement. But first of all, the movement is covered by these protective panels which slide into grooves. The reason they're there is cleanliness. It's again critical that this clock is kept clean. Any dirt and it becomes a useless object as far as any form of accurate time measuring is concerned. Finally, inside the movement. A few things that I'll just draw your attention to. The huge pendulum is hung from the back of the case. There's a good reason for that. If that was hung from the movement, very practically it would twist the movement. That weight would damage the movement. It, it would just not function. So it's fixed to the back of the case. You'll also notice here the case is secured to the wall. There's a good reason for that. If it wasn't, it would probably walk across the hall. The pendulum is so heavy, it would move the clock. Um, so it's solid, it's absolutely secure. Our initial view inside the movement is what could be loosely termed a jumble of pillars, arbours and escapement components. It's a very busy picture in there. Which is quite surprising for a relatively simple clock. It only tells the time. But it looks very complicated and there's reasons for that. Just here, if I just highlight there, there's the lever for the maintaining power. It runs across there and it puts power on one of the wheels when you pull the lever. Coming back to the gridiron pendulum, in this image you can quite clearly see the pendulum rods made of brass and steel brass and steel that that is a very very good way of stability that was achieved by experimentation and Harrison was an, was an experimenter he was a carpenter initially by trade and he experimented which is a very typical clock making thing to do um, and he discovered that this really did work. Of course, later on, um, other clockmakers found other methods of consistency. The glass jar with and suspending it on a, on a steel rod is a very good way of consistent timekeeping. The mercury expands as the steel expands and keeps a consistent position of the pendulum. So draw your attention to the beautifully made pulley and carrier. Something of real interest in this clock, which is very unusual, is how the arbors are held with two large plates for the clock. On normal clocks, they have bearing holes in them, and the arbors run in those bearing holes Obviously we have another problem, we're back to the oil problem. That's okay while the oil's good. As soon as the oil deteriorates, we have a problem. So the makers of this clock devised a very ingenious and complicated system. Here, poking out the side of the movement, is a large roller. All of the arbors in this clock are suspended or held on roller bearings, large rollers. 
illustrated here. This is the turning arbor on which maybe the, is mounted or the escape wheel, and that's revolving. That's resting on these larger wheels, which are pivoted in secondary plates. So one revolution of that wheel, that arbor, is only moving at a fractional amount. So the whole pressure and wear is dissipated through these three rollers. Very ingenious, very difficult to make, and uh, very difficult to make accurately so it run run properly. But it does, and it works extremely well. We look at the escapement on this clock, which is uh, a very interesting escapement, and, and maybe slightly later um, than than the makers of this clock. This may have been um, Vulamy's, Justin Vulamy's son, Benjamin, who put this particular escapement in this clock. I'm not too sure about that, um, but it, it's possibly that way. There's been a lot of alterations on the clock, which makes it even more interesting. Um, these large pillars which hold the plates in position. One of them up here has been cut off, just sawn straight off, and the remains of it still intact. So there have been major um, alterations. Again, that's a very typical thing to happen in a workshop like the Volumi Gray workshop, where they were experimenting. They were looking at innovation, how to achieve the best. As I said before, the escapement requires no oil, which is a really uh, excellent innovation. It's a peculiar escapement in that it doesn't tick. If you go out there and listen to the clock, it's silent, almost silent. It's because the escape wheel, as it travels around, and I have an animation for you in a moment, it's, it lands gently on the ivory pallets and then when it's passed on to the next pallet, it doesn't drop onto it, it's almost collected by the next pallet, which I'll illustrate in just a moment. You notice on the side of the case, you've got these very large blocks, which initially look quite strange, and they're simply to accommodate the arc of the pendulum, which is huge, um, which is typical of this kind of escapement. There's no lost power in this escape. So all the power is going to the pendulum. And that's wasted. But it does produce a very large arc, which has its own problems as well. Here's a better view of the escapement. And I'll just draw your attention briefly to a few things, because it's a quite a detailed picture and it's difficult to see. Here are one of the pallets, which is made of ivory. Ivory was used because it was uh, because there wasn't a rubbing sensation the, the brass escape tooth doesn't rub against a steel pallet of any kind it lands on there and holds and then is released at a later date when the other pallet is into its position just interesting here another very tip grew here so you can adjust the clock from above so once the clock is set and fixed to the wall if it's not quite level, it doesn't matter because you have a screw here that you can adjust to bring the clock into perfect beat. Here's a, a not anima an animation, not of not my animation, an animation. It just shows the rough idea, really. If you imagine the pendulum is hanging from here, each of these pallets comes into action and then naturally releases. There's no rubbing and no need for oil. It's when this pallet escapes, it's when that one pushes the wheel very slightly backwards. And if you observe and look in detail at the second hand, you'll see it goes forward and then bounces back a long way. And it's doing that because there's no lost energy and the pendulum bob is almost driving the, the movement backwards. It's a very, very efficient escapement. However, it has a downside to it. If the power is removed from the clock, both of the arms can be released and the clock can just 
unwind a dangerous Before I close, I will just give a little bit of detail about the, the period of this clock and a little bit about the makers. Benjamin Gray, he was a royal watchmaker. He was born in 1676 and died in 1764. This clock would have been made towards the end of his life, I think. Um, Justin Bullamy, he was of Swiss origin. Uh, much has been written about the Bullamy family, so I won't... Um, go on too much about that. There are those better qualified than myself to discuss that. But as I say, he was from Switzerland originally. Um, he worked in Paris, it's believed, for a while, and then came to London in the 1730s. He began an association with Benjamin Gray at some point after that, and married his daughter, which was a good move, I think in 1741. Their official partnership began in, said in 1743. The, in conclusion, really, um, we can see from this slide a close-up of the pulley. It's not necessary for that detail and that beautiful design for this clock, but the clockmaker wanted that there. They wanted to produce something that not only was extremely functional, but had aesthetic beauty to it as well. We've seen that this important regulator is, is, regulator is full of innovation and experimentation. The makers seem to have been driven by a desire to continually improve on what previous clockmakers had achieved. Their goal was to achieve the best possible measurement of the passing of time over a given period. It's clearly seen in this last slide the makers not only made a technically remodeled regulator but also created an object that is, has been beautifully executed. It's a credit to the makers that over 260 odd years on it continues to function and tell us a story of a time in our history when clockmaking was so closely linked to huge advances in the development of both astronomy and navigational understanding. Thank you for listening.